Good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining this virtual roundtable on sustainable events. I'm Victoria Elema. I'm the infrastructure and environment attaché here at the Netherlands Consulate in San Francisco. Well, we've heard it this morning, LA is preparing for the most sustainable games in history. But what does a sustainable event look like? And how can we create positive environmental impact through sports? Today, we will learn from sustainability leaders in Los Angeles and in the Netherlands who will share their strategies and their inspiring showcases. We only have limited time today and six speakers waiting. So I would like to stress that this is only the beginning of an eight year trajectory. And I would like to encourage everyone to continue the discussion also after the session on our online platform, by email, or during one of our future events. This session consists of two parts. Part one will focus on strategies uh, in LA and in the Netherlands. Part two will highlight innovative showcases and leading examples in LA uh, and in the Netherlands as well. Um, the session will start with five minute introduction by our speakers, followed by Q&A. We also have a chat box. I see them right here at the laptop. You can send in your questions during the session. Uh, we will get back to them. Also, if we don't have time during the session, we will get back to you with an answer after the round table. So without further ado, I would like to introduce our first speaker, uh, Dominic, Dominic Hargways with the City of LA. Uh, Dominic is the, hi, <laughs> thank you for joining. Dominic is the Deputy Chief Sustainability Officer with the City of Los Angeles. Last year, the City of Los Angeles published its Green New Deal, a very ambitious strategy. Um, Dominic, thank you so much for joining. And can you walk us through the plan and maybe also focus on what it means for the Olympics and for events in general? Yeah, thank you so much, Victoria. It's a real pleasure to be on this roundtable and be part of this event. Um, so as you mentioned, we published LA's Green New Deal last year, and it consists of four key principles. One is to act with urgency to uphold the Paris Climate Agreement. Another is to deliver environmental justice and equity. The third is to create pipelines to good paying jobs, as well as a just transition to a green economy. And the fourth is to lead by example, which is um, how the city um, will decarbonize our buildings, our transport, our waste streams, et cetera. So upholding the Paris Climate Agreement means that ultimately the city of LA will be carbon neutral by 2050. And this you know, really results in a lot of different co-benefits. Um, we will create 300,000 green jobs by 2035 through our efforts on the path to carbon neutrality. Um, we will save about $16 billion from prevented deaths and hospital admissions each year. And so, you know, this is really a plan to accelerate our greenhouse gas um, emission reduction targets. So the backbone of this is what we call the five zeros. So in order to be a carbon neutral city, we have to um, decline emissions everywhere as soon as possible to get to our zero carbon future. So first, um, and, and really most important is developing a zero carbon grid. And so this is about achieving 100% renewable energy by 2045. Second is zero carbon buildings. And so we will have 100% net zero carbon new buildings by 2030 and all buildings will be zero carbon by 2050. Next is a zero carbon transportation system. So this is about electrifying um, all forms of transit by 2050. So zero emission vehicles um, everywhere. Next is waste, which is very important and really a challenge, especially um, in light of COVID. A lot of our recycling streams have been disrupted here. And unfortunately, a lot of restaurants um, have had to go back to single-use plastics, um, which is a real shame, but we're, we're working on it. So um, this, this fourth zero of the five zeros is LA becoming a zero-waste city and the largest zero-waste city. So we will have 100% landfill diversion rate by 2050. The last zero is zero wasted water, our most precious natural resource. So 100% of our wastewater 
will be recycled by 2035. And so I would just like to quickly talk about um, some of the goals that LA will achieve as part of LA's Green New Deal that will happen before the 2028 Olympic and Paralympic Games. Um, one is that we will ensure LA is prepared for autonomous vehicles. Another is we will phase out single-use plastics by 2028 and eliminate organic waste going to the landfill. We will also end street homelessness by 2028. We will complete at least five new net zero projects um, within our own city um, buildings. We will increase tree canopy in areas of greatest need by at least 50% by 2028. And last but certainly not least is we will provide 100% clean power to power the 2028 Olympic and Paralympic Games. So um, with that, I'll turn it back to Victoria and Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dominic, for this introduction. And I agree because of the current situation, it's a shame that we have to go back on some of the uh, policies we had, had introduced before. I know that in San Francisco, we're just starting again with using recyclable bags when we go grocery shopping. So that's a start. But uh, let's see. Uh, where this takes us, and hopefully we'll get back to a more normal situation pretty soon. Uh, we'll get back to you later with uh, a couple of questions, but first, uh, let's hear, hear more about the approach in the Netherlands. Uh, joining us from The Hague is Chitske Ipma. Chitske is the Circular Economy Lead at the Ministry of the Environment. Chitske, thank you so much for joining. I know that's a little bit later in the Netherlands already. Thank you for being here, <laughs> and um, the floor is yours. Yes, thank you. I'd like to say good morning and good evening uh, uh, at the same time. Um, yeah, uh, let me, because we have limited time, let me start right away uh, by stressing a little bit about the Dutch ambitions for circular economy. Um, this is my angle. It's pretty broad by itself, but um, uh, it's, 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 and it's not an angle except for uh, energy and sustainable mobility. Um, if you look at circular economy, the ambitions of um, us as in the Netherlands is to become fully circular by 2050 and to reduce our resource use by half by 2030. Um, and we have a specific focus and specific policies for priority areas such as plastics, uh, construction, uh, food uh, and consumption goods. Um, and it's basically a huge transition. It's, it requires a system change. Um, you can look at it as like a zero waste economy and you can't achieve a zero waste economy if you don't include sustainable design, uh, new production and consumption patterns. Um, it's about not just technological innovation, but also uh, social innovation, like changing behavior, uh, as well as different ways of cooperation across value chains. Um, and you really need innovative front runners to invent new uh, solutions, uh, new business models. Uh, and I think festivals and events are excellent living labs for a circular economy. Um, basically, you can look at them as temporary cities. Uh, the sector is very innovative, pioneering, um, uh, and um, uh, it's, it, it, it's a very good testing ground to, to try out new innovations, to get immediate feedback, uh, and to improve on-site, so to say. Um, it's mostly you're looking at like generally a young crowd and at least open uh, to, to new ideas and solutions. So I think that's a very good place where you can try out test innovations and scale up um, any good practices. Uh, and I think that's the big potential of sustainable and circular events and festivals, the potential for scaling up. You can scale up to you know, share the solutions to other festivals. You can um, include other events. Uh, you can, uh, uh, lots of festivals are already uh, working closely with local authorities, so you can uh, scale up to cities. Uh, and I think also uh, to scale up across the population, you can really boost awareness and behavior change by uh, demonstrating uh, what circular economy looks like in practice. Um, as a government, we are really looking at supporting front runners uh, to, to, to build this transition. And our Green Deal um, can, we, we see our Green Deal approach is a very valuable tool to support front runners. Um, I will mention uh, in the slide that was just shown, uh, I, I'd like to set some important characteristics, uh, characteristics of the way uh, we look at Green Deals because the, the topic, there's lots of Green Deals already. There's a European Green Deal as well. 
And if you look at it as a Dutch tool, um, there's some important traits. It's like it's voluntary, but it's uh, not without obligation. The, the, the commitments are very specific, very time bound. You look in the three to five years. Um, the, as a government, we really try to convene partners, bring people together to create an atmosphere of trust where companies that may look at each other as competitors can really work together for a shared objective. Um, and as a government, really try, we try to remove any barriers those frontrunners encounter along the way, like barriers in legislation, for example. Um, if you look specifically at the Green Deal for Circular Festivals, um, well, Xander will tell you a little bit more about that uh, in the next uh, part of the session. Um, I'd like to stress just the main elements. Uh, the ambition is to make all Dutch festivals circular, circular by 2025. And we already, well, if I can say that, we're, I think we're uh, uh, making good progress. Um, the purpose is also to inspire other festivals by sharing knowledge and experiences. Uh, we work with cities to, to, to scale up results. Uh, we want to boost public awareness and behavior change. And I think it's also interesting that defining what is a circular festival, what is a circular event, to bring a very broad concept and make it very concrete and specific and operational, that's part of the endeavor. That's part of the Green Deal. Um, and Jen will tell you a little bit more about that also. Um, we are now looking at expanding to include the sports uh, events. And I'm very happy with this exchange between uh, Netherlands partners in Los Angeles to see how we can connect our front runners and, and uh, share experience and learn from each other to really make sustainable sports events a reality. Um, and I'm happy that uh, the platform Holland Circular Hotspot is also part of this mission because this is the way we hope to connect our front runners and, and to, to create new partnerships. So uh, this is, I think, the most important part of the Dutch ambitions. I'm happy to hear more about the months in LA. So thank you very much. Thank you, Chitske, for this introduction. And good to hear that, I think, what you said, events can be a great testing ground for circular approaches uh, and, and to test them later on, maybe even on neighborhood level or city levels. Um, so thank you. And I think we will get back to you later in the session. In recent years, sustainability has transformed from a niche concern to a leading consideration for sports venues. Our next speaker will tell us more about sustainability in the built environment. Thanks for joining us today, Ben Stapleton. Ben is the executive director with the U.S. Green Building Council, the Los Angeles chapter, the largest chapter in the U.S. Uh, ben has extensive experience with uh, real estate, technology, innovation, and sustainability, and also launched and managed the LA Kretz Innovation Campus in Los Angeles. Uh, ben, the floor is yours. Good morning, and thank you for having me this morning. I'm excited to be here. Um, we've been building a, a long-term relationship with you and your organization, and we're excited to, to, to keep doing that. Um, first, a little bit about our organization. Um, we're an independent nonprofit. You know, our mission is really uh, focused on accelerating sustainability in the built environment here for Southern California. And ultimately, our organization is about people. We're, we're a community of people who are passionate about transforming our region, who are passionate about sustainability, uh, that includes everyone from architects and engineers to contractors, developers, property managers, engineers, and, and, and everyone in that value chain, down to folks who just care about sustainability or, or green building consultants or sustainability consultants. Um, I have a, a number of events up here on the right-hand side of the screen uh, that are coming up for us. You know, Right now, we have two to three digital events uh, a week. Um, you can participate in those from wherever you are. And it's a great way to, to join our community. Um, and uh, a lot of these are focused on education and engagement, uh, which is how a lot of our, our integration in the market really happens. Uh, next slide, please. Um, one of the ways that you can do that is we, we have seven committees here at USGBCLA. These committees meet once a month. They're open to, to anyone to join. Uh, and it's really just passionate groups of people who are working on projects here in our city, ranging from sustainability and construction uh, to building decarbonization, which is a big issue for us right now, as, as Dominique touched on earlier, uh, to green schools here in our region. Uh, we also have a group called the LA Sustainability Executives Roundtable, which has all of our corporate sustainability executives from the largest companies here in LA. Uh, and, and these folks, again, meet once a month to really figure out how we can do boots on the ground projects and efforts to, to really move sustainability forward in our communities. Next slide, please. Uh, one of the things I really want to talk about today, which, which I think is incredibly important, 
Um, you know, I, I think LA is just sort of a great microcosm of the world. You know, we have urban and suburban environments. We've got a very diverse communities here. Last year, we launched a net zero accelerator. This is an accelerator for startups uh, that's really focused on piloting and promoting technologies that can make an impact in the built environment. We're not the kind of accelerator that's gonna help you figure out the best legal structure for your company, uh, but we are really focused on getting technology into buildings as quickly as possible and really getting that fine tuned. Uh, so we have uh, over 20 different pilot partners here in the LA market that have committed to look at, at pilots. Uh, and we have over 30 advisors that commit to work with companies and we're really building a strong innovation community uh, in, in the built environment here in the LA region uh, and really wanna serve as a hub. So when you're looking at market entry here in LA, uh, we hope to be a landing pad for you as you look to, to get your technology to market and touch base with projects. Uh, next slide, please. Um, here's a snapshot of uh, our cohort of technologies. We're actually making our announcement today. Our press release goes out on who was selected for the program this year. A big focus for us this year on clean construction and occupant health. Um, building decarb continues to be a focus as well, but I think we've got about eight materials companies in this cohort this year. And as we continue to get more transparency around the materials that we use to build our buildings, uh, we have some incredible opportunity to really reduce their carbon footprint uh, going forward. Next slide, please. Um, one of the things I wanted to mention, and again, it's just a great way to, to connect with our community here. Uh, in March, uh, we launched a talent portal here for our regions. This is a centralized hub where we have uh, posted job opportunities, featured employers, upcoming training, recorded content, and a mentor network. Uh, so it's really meant to be a, a, a one-stop shop for you to learn how to upgrade your own talent set, find good people, uh, find good companies to work with. Uh, I encourage you to, to, to come check it out. Uh, it, it's a great way to, to improve your own uh, skill set as well as connect with folks in, in our community. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, one of the things that's been really important for us, you know, obviously with everything we're experiencing you know, from the pandemic and is how do we provide healthier spaces for, for really everyone? Um, this program we launched in May is something we've been working on for about a year, uh, but it's really focused on, on making healthy buildings accessible. Uh, we found that a lot of the healthy building certifications that were out there were just expensive and, and complicated. And it's very difficult for people to engage in a conversation of how do I improve the health of the space that I'm in? And so we created a simple framework around five uh, principles around indoor air quality, green cleaning, access to nature, inspiring movement and water testing. Uh, and it's, this is a commitment that any building owner or any tenant can make. We've got an incredibly positive reception on this and are excited about the opportunity to again, create healthier spaces for people who live in our communities uh, to, to occupy day in and, and day out. Next slide, please. Um, one to mention uh, quickly, you know, our largest conference of the year is our Municipal Green Building Conference and, and Expo. Uh, maybe not the greatest name for a conference ever, uh, but it's been around almost 20 years now and is really the, the largest gathering of people who work in sustainability in the green building community uh, here in the Southern California region. Uh, this year we'll be doing it virtually, so you can join from wherever you are. Um, we have an, a day that's, that's on a Friday that's focused on industry and we're gonna have nine workshops. We have four keynotes, we have a bunch of awards. We're gonna be showcasing all the, the net zero accelerator companies I mentioned earlier. And then on Saturday, August 22nd, we have a day that's really focused on engaging the community where we'll have some more keynotes, we'll have workshops. Uh, so you can learn about things you can do to, to increase sustainability in your own home and your own environment. Uh, so I'd really encourage you to check this out and, and join if you can. Um, it's you know really a great opportunity to learn about what's happening in LA uh, and where we're headed in the years to come. And thank you for the, for the time today. And I, I look forward to connecting with more of the folks uh, here in the session. Great. Thank you, Ben. And I know that um, the network and the experience the Green Building Council has in LA is tremendously valuable for Dutch organizations looking to expand their network uh, in Los Angeles. So I would definitely encourage all participants to look into that and to look into the events you'll be organizing virtually now. We also visited the Green Building Council in November with our trade mission, which was a huge success. So thank you so much for, uh, for this overview. Um, before we move to Q&A, I would like to uh, give the speakers of this first part the opportunity to react to each other. Um, who wants to start? Jitske, do you want to start? Yes. Um, yeah, sorry, there's a big echo here, but I'm happy to, I'm hoping you don't hear that. Um, yeah, I think I'm, I'm, I, I like, as I already said at the beginning of my pitch, um, I'm looking at it from a circular economy angle, which is pretty wide by itself, but I really like how 
in Los Angeles, you really connect all those issues. You connect energy, uh, zero waste, uh, sustainable mobility, the social element. Uh, I think that's really intriguing for me and I would love to hear more about that, but the time is too short. But I think that's a very excellent way to really have an integrated approach to sustainability and to get all objectives uh, worked out. Anybody want to respond Thank to you. this? Thank you. It's you know, incredibly important issue, as, as Dominique hit on earlier. You know, right now with the impacts from from the COVID pandemic, and when we look at you know PPE and single-use plastics, uh, we really have to rethink how we're going to continue to make progress when it comes to achieving zero waste. Uh, and 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 frankly, it's it's you know thrown a lot of things off balance. So we need to work that much harder to to bring it back. Uh, I was really incredibly thrilled to, to meet with your delegation here uh, last November. Uh, and really blown away by some of the work you're doing there in terms of inventorying materials and buildings, um, you know, really creating some of the zones you've created in the city where you can and really track waste on a much more detailed level. Uh, we hope to get to that point at, at, at some point in the future. Yeah, I totally agree. I have so much respect for the work that's been done on circular economy and particularly around buildings in the Netherlands. and. Um, we're trying to think, you know, very carefully about how we cultivate, you know, the use of um, zero emission construction equipment, which is like unheard of here in the U.S., but we know it's very popular um, in Europe. So we're trying to instigate, um, you know, projects that will um, use that type of equipment you know, reduce embodied carbon in our building materials and really, you know, instigate retrofits at scale because existing buildings, you know, hold so much carbon already that, you know, the the prospect of, you know, tearing them down to build yet another building um, is not, you know, is not going to get us to our goals. So... Um, we're looking at retrofits and zero emission construction equipment and then reducing embodied carbon as well. Can I maybe ask a, a question because it's, it's been mentioned a couple of times. Um, so I, because you can, I hear two different um, uh, sounds, so to say. Sometimes you hear that COVID makes it more difficult to implement sustainability amb ambitions because you know people have other things on their mind. As, on the other hand, you hear that this actually gives people time to invest uh, in, in in changes and in innovations. They normally wouldn't have time for that. And now it's like like a small space, so to say, to really make work of sustainable uh, objectives. What, what's your experience with that? How, what do you what do you see mostly? It's very interesting. Um, an example, a positive example in Los Angeles right now, is. Although our schools are closed, we've been able to do energy efficiency projects while the schools are closed. So we've done 12 pretty extensive energy retrofits for our schools that will really have a lasting impact when um, students and teachers and administrators go back. Um, also, we've been able to do things um, regarding transportation um, that also are very inspired by European um, methods in terms of um, creating slower streets. So streets that are way more pedestrian and bike friendly. Um, we have a program called LA Alfresco, which is also repurposing sidewalks and streets for outdoor dining. Um, we've been able to install as well um, four new bus only lanes that pre COVID were very, very difficult for us politically to install. So a, a lot of positives on, um, you know, transportation, um, it, it just making streets, you know, giving streets back to people, which is fascinating because you probably know LA is a very car centric culture our roads and our neighborhoods have all been designed around cars. So actually getting people to walk, bike, scoot, roll, be outside um, has been a, a positive outcome for us. 
Thank you, Dominic. That's at least one of the positive outcomes of the current situation, that we can spend some more time outside and, and on the streets as well. Um, let's take an audience Q&A. Uh, I saw one coming in about collaboration between government and other partners. How can we maximize this collaboration? And do you have any examples of what works or what doesn't work? And I think this is actually a question for all of you. Um, but because of the time, maybe you can limit your answers to uh, one minute. Uh, you know, I, I'd say that, that there's a number of examples, you know, here in L.A. Um, where there's been some good collaboration. You know, I, I think the city here has done a good job in reaching out to folks who are experts, you know, whether it's in waste or in mobility and really trying to source ideas on, on what we can do to be better together. You know, the, the challenge is that everything takes time and, and it's, it's always multifaceted. Uh, even getting back to the to the last question that was asked around around COVID, you know, there's there's pros and cons, and I think, you know, we're entering a time where city budgets, you know, state budgets are going to be constrained, you know, due to the decrease in tax revenues. Uh, same thing for a lot of our companies right now, trying to trying to find revenue in in, in this post COVID environment, and so I think it's going to require us to be more creative and to work more together uh, to continue to move things forward uh, when it comes to our mission around sustainability and. You know what COVID has done that's a pro is it you know it has created this space right it's created this pause it's created this disruption and so now is the time for us to to try to see how we can shift things while we're in a moment of pause um, but it, it won't be easy. Jessica or Dominic wants to add on that? Yeah, um, I was just thinking back to this really interesting innovative um, mechanism that's been going on here in LA for the last two months. And it's a, it's a partnership between City of LA and MasterCard. And we understand that, you know, the economics right now for your average Angelino are really, really dire. And so we partnered with MasterCard and the philanthropic community, which donated millions of dollars to the Angelino card. And those cards are loaded with $1,500 each and um, through a lottery system were distributed to people in need across Los Angeles. So that's something kind of like universal basic income, um, which was a stretch for us to think about, you know, before COVID, but now has resulted in uh, a pilot that has really helped people to be able to buy groceries, you know, buy the things that they, they truly need and um, so that's that's an interesting partnership that is new for us, but I think we're going to see more innovations like that um, to help you know people rebound and, and build back better. Creative new solution. I see Chitska also wants to say something. <laughs> Please be brief before we go to the next part of the session. <laughs> yes, I will. Um, yeah, I think uh, well, I think what Ben already mentioned and Dominic as well. Uh, they mentioned some very interesting hubs, and communities, and I think one way to maximize collaboration is to connect those hubs to communities because that's where the knowledge is. That's where the front runners are. Um, uh, and that's where you can really share your know, results. And one example is that I was really impressed by that. And maybe Zen will say something about it. Uh, there's one festival that really invested in, in, in a zero waste um, uh, efforts. Uh, so the result after a one, the one day of the festival was a quarter of a garbage bag. And it was mainly, mainly cigarette butts. And you know, if, you, if, you, if you know that, you really want to know how did you do that? And those results are out there. And we want... To, you know, I think it's really important to connect the people that want to copy that, that want to learn from those experiences and take, take those examples and put it into practice in their own, in their own environment. So I think to connect those communities, and I think some of them are represented at this mission as well, I think it's, uh, that's, that's going to be key. Thank you so much, Jiska. And I would like to thank you all for uh, contributing to this first part. Unfortunately, this is all we have for the, for the first part of this session. And sorry that we're running a little bit late as well. Uh, but again, uh, please continue the conversation. Also, if your schedule allows, please stick around for the second part of this session, uh, in which we will be hearing from some uh, true sustainability leaders who will share their uh, examples with us today. Um, first, we have Michael Hike from the Coliseum in Los Angeles. Good morning, Michael. Thank you for being here. Uh, thank you for having me. I'm excited to be uh, surrounded by uh, sustainable leaders. Um, thank you. 
Great. Uh, Michael is the uh, operational coordinator and operator of the Los Angeles Memorial Coliseum Zero Waste Program. Uh, the program has been uh, recognized with um, a lot of different awards uh, last year by LA County um, for being um, uh, the, the zero waste facility, so to say. Uh, and Michael will take us through the program uh, and highlight also, I guess, what, what has been working for you uh, in making it such a successful initiative uh, and share, uh, share his advice with the rest of us. Uh, Michael, over to you. Thank you. Um, as stewards of the greatest stadium in the world, uh, the Los Angeles Memorial Coliseum, felt it was critically important to set an example for uh, future generations, for our guests and patrons. Um, in 2013, uh, the University of Southern California um, assumed operational management of the Los Angeles Memorial Coliseum. Uh, at that time, uh, there was no composting program, uh, no recycling program. Um, all large scale events such as USC Trojan Games, festivals, concerts, et cetera, uh, were diverted strictly to landfill. Um, we're a very large facility um, at 77,000 capacity today. So imagine the landfill that was diverted um, in 2013. Uh, in 2015, the Coliseum staff felt like it was critically important to develop a waste stream program. Um, at that time, uh, we began to implement the zero waste program. Um, and next slide, please. Um, as you can see, starting in 15, we've made uh, dramatic improvements uh, to present day. Uh, Two-time Pac-12 Waste Champion Bowl uh, winner, uh, received various awards for, um, uh, from the LA County um, and also the Environmental Innovator uh, Year uh, winner. Um, and then this past season, we were uh, first runner-up in the uh, Pac-12 Waste Challenge. Uh, I look forward to 2020, um, hopefully to climb back to the top. That is one of my goals for this upcoming season. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, the success of the program is engaging all of our stakeholders, from our custodial staff to our catering staff, uh, to our eco product staff, our uh, sanitation provider, um, our waste haulers, such as Athens and Republic, uh, recycling pays. Um, everyone plays a key component in the success of this program. Um, to give an example of a SC football game and how the program actually operates, um, our custodial staff will get on site um, about two hours prior to gates opening. Um, they will begin collecting waste um, as soon as uh, patrons and fans are in the facility. Um, they will continue to service our bins throughout the entirety of the game. Um, they will haul all of our uh, waste inside the building to our waste compound where there the bags are stripped open physically and hand sorted by our tremendous sorting staff. Um, from there, um, it is uh, sorted into two different uh, compactors, a compostable compactor and then a recycling compactor. Um, our sort staff takes great pride in the success that they've had. Um, they're really the ingredients and the key cogs of the success that we've had within this program. Um, from there, uh, next slide please. Uh, our tremendous waste haulers, Athens, Recycling Pays, and Republic will collect um, both compactors. They will haul them off to the compostable facilities and recycling facilities uh, where they do a waste characterization, break down exactly what was in our facility, um, how well our sort staff did, and they provide me an analysis of what was in each compactor. Next slide, please. So to give some numbers of this past season and just to show what our program does as a whole, um, on average, we haul off about 11 to 12 tons of compost uh, per event. Um, we successfully divert about seven to eight tons of compost per event. Um, per event, we uh, will haul off about uh, seven to eight tons of recyclables per event. Uh, when I say per event, that's classified as a major event, um, about 25,000 plus. Um, we successfully divert uh, about six to eight tons of recycling. Uh, the reason the recycling diversion is a little bit higher than what's hauled. Um, sometimes the recycling tends to bleed into our compost and our uh, partners do a terrific job of separating that. Um, we do a fantastic job of landfill in my opinion um, due to the sheer size of our facility. The fact that we only have about a ton and a half to two tons of landfill per game in my opinion is pretty remarkable. Um, there are certain areas within our facility on a game day that um, are strictly just have to be landfill. 
um, specifically the locker room. Um, those are the team spaces, the promoter spaces, and we respect their privacy and respect their wishes, and we're thankful that they're using our facility. Um, this past season, um, we were fortunate enough to have a brand new uh, premium tower, seven level premium tower, which included a state of the art kitchen. Um, that kitchen produces tons of, of food for the entire facility on any given game day. Um, we were uh, fortunate enough to partner with a local charity that will come and collect our remaining food waste. Um, we were able to donate a, a little under two tons of food waste this past season. Um, and then additionally, uh, we have a partnership with uh, JNR Grease. Um, we were able to repurpose about two tons of grease into biofuel. Um, so uh, tremendous success there. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, as everyone here is aware, uh, you can classify yourself as a zero waste facility or a zero waste uh, event if you achieve 90% or plus, 90% plus. Um, we were successful in 10 out of 14 uh, major events, uh, football games this past season. Um, in my opinion, it was remarkable considering we had uh, new management at the top of the Los Angeles Memorial Coliseum staff. Um, we had new management at the top of the zero waste program. Um, we had a brand new uh, custodial uh, staff and we found our groove as we kind of pushed on throughout the year. Um, it, in my opinion, it was a tremendous job by all of our stakeholders and everyone involved. Um, it was a collective effort, a group team effort, and um, we look to continue that success next season. Next slide, please. So to provide uh, another visual of how far we've come since 2015, um, as you can see where the recycling and compostable diversion numbers were when the program started and the positive climb we've made um, it, it's just a tremendous um, accomplishment by our staff, uh, by our partners, and it, it just highlights um, the, the success that we continue to plan or continue to have um, throughout the last four years since the birth of this program. Um, thank you for having me. Um, you know, it's uh, an honor to be surrounded by such sustainable leaders. Thank you, Michael, and truly really impressive what you've been doing at the Coliseum. Just a quick question um, before we go to the next speaker. I think that fans are a very important part of, of your success as well. How do you get them excited to, to join and participate and, and, and join the recycling efforts that you, um, that you have at the Coliseum? Yes, ma'am. Uh, we, we highlight um, our success and we, we um, have plenty of signage throughout our facility that really uh, ignites and um, displays what we're trying to do within the Coliseum. Um, there's signage on every single trash bin. Uh, we have signage that drapes the concourse. We have signage that drapes our street level. Um, and uh, we're very fortunate that uh, SC, um, one of our uh, tenants is massive on sustainability and they promote our program throughout their campus and their community. Great, and I think this is a great opportunity also for, for educational purposes. Um, Absolutely. your program that you have at the Coliseum. Well, thank you, Michael, and we'll get back to you in a bit. Uh, but first, we'll go to our next speaker joining us from the Netherlands. It's Xander Kultvis. Uh, Xander, uh, good, good afternoon or good evening almost. Uh, thanks for being here today. Xander is a manager at the Revolution Foundation and has a lot of experience with circular systems and designing circular systems, monitoring waste streams. Uh, and he will tell us more about that and also about the Green Deal uh, circular festivals that he's being a part of. Xander, over to you. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, and good morning, LA. Good evening, Amsterdam. It's uh, quite a time difference, so it's pretty cool to be uh, in touch with you all. And uh, today I'm going to be talking about the Green Deal Circular Festivals in Europe um, and uh, especially the monitoring framework that we came up with. And uh, just as a short introduction, I'm uh, also a team of the Green Deal Circular Festivals um, in, uh, in Amsterdam in the Netherlands. And I'm actually uh, leading and heading the monitoring department for this Green Deal. Um, and uh, I'm going to immediately go over the vision. So uh, the next slide is fine. Um, Next slide, please. Yeah, thank you. Um, the vision of this Green Deal is actually to collaborate with festivals to accelerate the transition from a linear to a circular economy. And uh, we work with a couple of different strategic goals and a couple of different uh, segments we focus on. So first of all, festivals, um, we want them to strive for full circularity uh, from now until 2025. 
Um, but that's not the only thing we're focused on. We also want to spin off all the results and the outcomes um, to cities. So we make we want to make everything applicable to cities as well. Same goes for other types of events, such as sports events. Uh, and we also want to transfer over our knowledge and our results to the general public um, to inspire everyone around the world and also to uh, bring about this behavioral change. And uh, we're going to do that by um, yeah, performing a couple actions. So we're going to be creating roadmaps, uh, a toolbox and a monitoring tool that I will be uh, highlighting in a couple seconds. So next slide, please. Uh, so first of all, the roadmaps, um, we're going to work together with the festivals who are mostly music festivals, by the way, uh, in Europe from different types of countries, um, ranging from 20,000 people a day to more than 100,000 people a day. Um, and um, yeah, we're going to help them, you know, create their steps towards creating circular events. Then second of all, we're also going to be, uh, and next slide please, uh, we're going to be creating a toolbox which features circular best practices, uh, knowledge, but also um, yeah, some pieces of research or, or other types of um, academic sources that are out there um, to help others actually implement these best practices as well. Uh, and for, third of all, we're going to be uh, creating a monitoring tool um, to, to actually monitor progress and to uh, display results. And uh, we're going to go to the next slide. I'm going to dig a little deeper into the dashboard that we're going to be building. Um, and it's basically consisting of three different monitors. Um, we're going to be firstly focusing on six different themes of uh, circularity for a circular festival. Um, then second of all, we're going to create a festival donut, which is based on the donut economy created by Kate Rayworth. I don't know if you know it, but it's a very interesting new model that works with ecological boundaries. Um, and third of all, we're going to be also making a program monitor for this Green Deal to see how the Green Deal itself as a program is doing. Then, um, well, we started with a model of a circular festival, which basically for us now uh, constitutes of six different themes. Uh, energy, resource efficiency, which some would call waste, uh, plastics, travel and transportation, uh, food and water. And within all these different themes, we have a couple of sub goals um, that we strive for. So I'm not going to go over all the different themes. I put them in the slides, uh, but there's a couple uh, sub goals, plus also the reason why we chose these uh, themes. So for energy, I'm just going to highlight all the goals. Uh, all energy needs to come from renewable sources. Um, then I think we can skip on to the next slide, which is resource efficiency. Uh, and there the goal is to make sure that all the materials are cycled at the highest possible value and residual waste uh, slash landfill uh, slash incineration doesn't exist. Um, then for plastics, um, we have one other goal, which is to use, uh, actually to uh, eliminate um, the use of plastic packaging and materials as much as we can, refuse it or reduce it or recycle it. Uh, then we can skip on to mobility. Um, and over there, the goal is to um, eliminate all the greenhouse gas emissions coming from transportation movements. So scope one, two, and three. Um, then for, I think it's food or water first, um, we aim for all the use of fresh water is reduced as much as possible. Nutrients are recovered from wastewater and also energy from wastewater. And then for food, we're still working on it. Uh, it's a very hard one to define, but we're uh, actually now defining it as uh, this sub goal. So natural resources are used responsible. Um, the food waste is prevented and residual flows are reused at the highest possible value. So those are the goals. And um, yeah, that also leads to a very practical set of indicators that we created uh, to also see if we're heading into the right direction. This is still uh, under construction. So we're now heading into the first, um, yeah, sort of session, validation session with uh, all the festivals and also with external partners or external um, institutions to actually validate these uh, different indicators to also make sure that they uh, um, link to existing indicators and other monitoring systems that are out there. Um, so this is still under construction, but still already very practical. And uh, then the next slide, I just want to talk here, talk about the Festival Donut Real Brief, which is the final monitor that we're still working on. Um, 
And it basically revolves around creating a context specific. So for a specific event, you want to define, first of all, um, the ecological boundaries that it operates in, just as Kate Rayworth also um, poses the ecological boundaries in her model. And then we want to uh, sort of reflect those um, with or compare those to the social and uh, um, yeah, societal foundations um, and uh, yeah, uh, facilities that they uh, that we can see within an event. So uh, we want to make sure that all those um, uh, dimensions are reflected, such as in the Sustainable Development Goals, the SDGs, which are also the base of um, the donut economy. And that is actually, in a nutshell, what we are going to be doing with the Green Deal Circular Festivals in Europe. And uh, I'm very happy that we are connecting with, um, yeah, also sports events and uh, LA. So I'm very happy to exchange thoughts and uh, to catch up. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Xander, for this introduction. And just a very quick question. I know you worked on a lot of different festivals and events. In your opinion, what is key? What works? Uh, what is the example of reducing waste on a festival? What would you, what would you recommend also to the other speakers here today? Uh, well, I would recommend acknowledging that circularity is more than just waste. Uh, it's taking a holistic approach and it's much more than only waste. We don't even call it waste anymore, but resources. Uh, but I would recommend doing your data analysis. So make sure that you know uh, what your baseline is, um, measure what matters, and then from there on set your goals and your ambitions. If you don't measure anything, then there's no use in setting goals. So I would say that's the step one. Monitoring waste streams, that's key in any sustainability approach. I think you're completely yeah. right. Thank you, Xander. Uh, we'll now move to our last speaker of this session, Brad Bloomberg. Thank you so much for joining us, Brad. Uh, Brett is the Director of uh, Sustainable Events and Analytics at the Green Sports Alliance. Uh, the Green Sports Alliance is a non-profit organization with a member base of over 300 professional and collegiate sport leagues, teams, venues and brands uh, that convene around a shared vision for a sustainable and equitable future. Brett, can you tell us more about the power of sports also to influence positive environmental impacts uh, in communities uh, around the world? Brett? Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much, Victoria. And hi, everybody. I mean, it's it's such an honor to be here and uh, to talk about sustainable events and sports. Um, I mean, it's such great work being done in Los Angeles with Michael at the Coliseum, Xander, all your work with the circular economy in the ne Netherlands. It's, it's really inspirational to see that and um, to see it coming to life on such a meaningful stage. Um, so, so that being said, I, I guess we can start with my, my first slide here. I'll just run. I know we're short on time uh, with the session. Yeah, yeah perfect. Um, so playing for the next generation, this is really um, a, a, a new slogan that the Green Sports Alliance has adopted for this uh, for this next decade of action, if you will. Um, and the Green Sports Alliance, we are a nonprofit launched in 2010 uh, to unite the North American sports market around sustainable best practices. Um, we've been largely responsible for the knowledge sharing and convening that has led to operational and educational advances throughout the industry for the past decade or so. Um, if you can go to the next slide, please. Um, thank you. Yep. So we are a remote team spread throughout the United States. Uh, myself, I'm in San Diego, which is about a two hours drive south of Los Angeles. Um, and as, as the newest staff member of the Green Sports Alliance, um, coming from a background in environmental engineering and sustainable event production, I really was brought on to analyze our collaboration and education efforts that have really been so critical to the industry over the past decade of, of uh, sustainable and, and this greening movement that has uh, emerged in the U.S. sports industry. And my responsibility is largely to expand this into communities to inspire scaled uh, solutions through this incredibly powerful platform of ours. You know, sports in the United States, just like sports in other countries. I mean, I, th there really is no uh, more powerful platform to inspire positive behavior change. Um, if you can continue to the next slide, please. So when I began building this initiative with my team in January, um, we began tapping into our vast network of leagues and teams and venues and brands to drive event greening and legacy programs uh, through the high visibility and reach of our industry's marquee events. So the marquee events that were considered uh, that the Green Sports Alliance is, is targeting for maximized action 
um, is really those all-star games, those championship events, um, and, and really um, some examples recently, as you can see on the left there of the screen, our work at the college football playoff national championship game, um, designing, implementing, and analyzing that program for them, um, as well as the ESPYs award show in Los Angeles, uh, the X Games, which has been in Los Angeles in the past, um, and other events that we're uh, considering that, that that are coming to Los Angeles. So uh, uh, our strategy really is a bit of a duality between local legacy impacts versus a shared global vision and, and universal best practices. So just as Xander was talking about with um, with the SDGs and the donut economy, you can see a little bit of that there. Um, our operational strategies are rooted in this global uh, metric platform to be able to unif- uh, uh, unite all of our events through a single metric and targeted transparency platform. Um, That being said, when it comes to the actual event production, we are very addicted to the data and an overconsumption of the environmental metrics, um, which is really why when I was brought on the team, um, they considered it as sustainable events and analytics, and we're trying to drive both of that. So um, we do believe that transparency is a critical gap in the United States special event and sports industry when it comes to sustainability management. And um, uh, for the sake of time here, um, I'll, I'll move on. So, so basically when COVID hit us and eliminated our, our industry events for virtually the year, we decided to take advantage of this opportunity and, and really ask ourselves, well, how can we set up better transparency systems for special sporting events and ongoing venue operations at our facilities? And so how can we hold ourselves accountable and how can we progress towards a shared vision. So as you can see here, this leads me to the final point uh, of of today, um, which is we we think that our industry is using this time as a wake-up call uh, across many social issues, across many environmental issues. And we've been looking at ourselves in the mirror and and listening to our membership base to really understand, well, what is our shared vision? But before our industry can even use its platform to, to reach that shared vision or communicate that, we need to really understand how to open up in the first place from coronavirus and open up safely and set a vision for the future. And uh, through a partnership with the U.S. Green Building Council and their ARC scorer team, uh, we developed a new initiative called Ready to Play, which consolidates information from and, and guidance from health uh, agencies such as the CDC and WHO. And it allows sports venue operators to compare their actions to recommended strategies across facilities management, occupant experience, indoor air quality. And in addition to this platform on the ARC uh, reentry website, we are also offering a webinar series and a playbook guide to help our, me- our members not, we, not, not provide a silver bullet to eliminate risk, but to come together as an industry and understand shared best practices to get us to the next level and get us towards reopening, learn from each other and continue to progress. So what we see this as is uh, an opportunity for us to really understand how can we leverage transparency and data analytics to drive the next wave of environmentalism in sports and of social sustainability as well and and equity. So um, essentially our partnership with USGBC is creating this platform and and we we do see our, our, our vision geared towards the future and the next steps. So if you can go to the final slide, please. So uh, finally, I just I want to add that we, we, we understand that these global events are coming to the, our country in 2026 and 2028. Um, our, our world is shifting so quickly beneath our feet right now. Um, and our globalized industry really needs to remain adaptable and forward thinking to ensure that the games uh, result in positive social and environmental outcomes for Los Angeles and the other host communities for these events. So um, one last shameless plug here, we we do have our annual Green Sports Alliance Summit, which is the largest uh, U.S. convener of of sports and sustainability. It's happening in October uh, uh, virtually. So we do want to invite each and every one of you to uh, hear from leaders, hear from the, the what's next uh, from the, the, the Green Sports Alliance and the Green Sports Movement in the United States and, and globally as well. So um, thank you all, and, and we look forward to continuing the conversation. Thank you so much, Brett, and we'll be sure to join the conference as well. It sounds very interesting. And also adds to Xander's point, I think. I see a possible collaboration uh, here. Um, do any of you want to react to each other's uh, presentations, questions, or remarks? Uh, we're a little bit short on time, but I do want to allow for, for some interaction here. So uh, who wants to start? I see Xander and Brad nodding as well. <laughs> I, I do have one question for, for you, Xander, just really quickly here. Um, I'm curious about the, the, the government, um, 
how you, your your uh, Green Deal for festivals has really been able to benefit from local government support and maybe what you would recommend for countries or counties that may not have that benefit of, of regulatory oversight or support or uh, uh, incentivization there? Well, yeah, the, the government here has been uh, a great help. So we have the local authorities and local government in Amsterdam, which is really progressive. Um, they put out uh, a directive for circular events. And if you don't, you know, adhere to their criteria, then you don't get a permit. So that, that is pushing the whole industry. Uh, you now have the Netherlands who are connecting um, the market parties to the government themselves with this Green Deal in Europe, which is a great, uh, great help. And uh, if you don't have that in, in your country or in your state, I would actually recommend um, you can do it yourself as well. Uh, it takes a lot of um, commitment, but then uh, we see that whenever you want to bring about change and uh, uh, and really change how the industry works, you need to get together and uh, operate as a collective. Because if you try to do it all at your, by yourself, um, it's going to be hard to change the, the status quo. So. Um, I would, I would want to say and recommend uh, unify, uh, unite, and uh, uh, and create a roadmap together, um, create an ambition together. Thank you, Xander. Michael, you do you want to add on that? Because I know that for you, the partnership with waste haulers and vendors was also key in sort of your success at the Coliseum. Do you want to uh, add on this? Absolutely. Um, Xander, I found your uh, presentation fascinating and look to... Uh, add some of those elements in here to our program. Um, Brad, we are already under the Green Sports Alliance umbrella and look forward to continuing that partnership for years to come. Great. And I just saw that we don't have any time for questions from the audience, unfortunately. But as I promised in the beginning, we will get back to you if you send in a question uh, after this session. Um, so for now, unfortunately, that's all we have. I would like to thank you for, for joining this session today. Uh, and and as I mentioned before, this is only the beginning. Um, we would like to continue the conversation with all of you. Uh, please sign up on our online platform uh, or reach out to us here at the consulate in San Francisco. Uh, we will be here and also for, for the next years looking forward to, uh, to continue this uh, collaboration with all of you. Um, for now, we will move into a break in which we will show a video from the Amsterdam Arena uh, that highlights some of the sustainability initiatives that are uh, implemented there. Uh, and after that, we'll go to the next session of our program hosted by my colleague Deborah. This is it for now. Thank you so much for joining today and uh, enjoy your day and hope to see you soon in real life. Thank you. Uh, in the past, we, we learned a lot of things the hard way, uh, and it, it started a couple of years before when the, the city of Amsterdam, again, uh, the, the city, the city plays a big role here uh, in Amsterdam, uh, the city asked us to be a sustainability icon uh, for the city. And, and we took on that very seriously. We gathered companies around us. And uh, one of the, the measures that we, we, we took is actually putting these solar panels on the roof. So 7,000 square meters of solar panels are on the roof. They, they provide us with around 10% of our energy. And, and the other uh, 90% are uh, basically done uh, or provided by, uh, how do you call this, the, the windmill. And... Um, and, and that, that is interesting because um, in 2015, uh, we had this all completed. And um, that meant that from that moment onwards, we were carbon neutral in our energy supply. Also because we are connected to the city heating and, and city cooling. Um, so, so far so good, uh, but uh, uh, you're referring to the energy storage. And uh, uh, back then it was still, uh, the case that we had diesel generators uh, there to provide with backup power, you know, during events. And of course that, you know, is a disgrace uh, in our sustainability approach. So we wanted to get rid of it, but it was very difficult to get to close the business case. Ultimately, we managed uh, to build that energy storage. Um, the energy storage, and this is a picture of it, is a three megawatt uh, energy storage consisting out of 140 uh, second-hand Nissan Leaf uh, car batteries. And uh, it, then this is providing now our backup power. It's not yet enough to run a full event on. It gives us about an hour, uh, roughly. Um, but we're growing into this and we're, we're planning on an expansion of this battery. 
But as I said, it, it, this doesn't close the business case because just for the backup power, it's a very limited uh, budget you, that you save from cutting out the diesel generator. So on a day-to-day -day basis, we lease out this uh, asset uh, to the grid operator and the grid operator uses it to balance the grid. That is a big part of the business case. And, and of course, uh, the, the, the storage also helps us uh, to do a bit of peak shaving so our energy uh, load is also a little bit less there. And um, so, yeah, so that, that was the important uh, part of it. Right now, uh, we indeed have that energy company. Uh, if you asked, would have asked me uh, four years ago uh, that we would start an energy company, I, I, I definitely would say you're completely mad. I would never believe it. Uh, but now, yeah, we, we are. We actually, you know, um, offering energy. Um, and, and the next step is uh, that we that this is the beginning of an energy grid for where we provide backup power solutions also for the venues in the surrounding area. And for this, we, uh, we, we found a large consortium of, of partners and we're now applying for uh, European funding. Yeah, I mean, we're trying to cut out packaging as, as much uh, as possible because in a, in a stadium like ours and, and in and other stadiums as well, uh, the catering is is a large has a large impact on um, uh, on the environment. Uh, packaging is is causing a lot of the waste that we that we cause. Um, so we're trying to cut that out, but there, there is a limit. Uh, to it. Um, so I think we, we pretty much reached that limit uh, by now. There's still some improvements to be made and our, our plan. Um, what we're now investigating is the process of the cups. Uh, we have plastic cups. Um, they cannot be reused, so it, it's all garbage. Uh, basically will be recycled, yes, but uh, cannot be reused. Um, and we have a, a huge amount of cups uh, for, let's say, Coca-Cola, or not, let's say, it's for Coca-Cola. And, and then we have a lot of cups uh, for, Heine for, for Heineken, and they're all painted. And apparently, uh, if you paint these cups, they're very difficult to recycle because you have to, you know, um, uh, take the, 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 the paint away uh, from, uh, from the plastic. And that is apparently a difficult process. So um, we have been engaging with both Coca-Cola and Heineken, the companies that have no relationship uh, in a way, uh, to come with a joint cup and not a, and a cup without paint, but with imprinted their logos. Uh, so, uh, so that you, you can actually feel the logos when you, when you go over the cup uh, instead of, you know, uh, involving paint. Uh, this, this is almost there, I would say. And uh, when it's there, it will be a huge improvement because it's better to recycle uh, these cups. And plus, you, you need uh, way less, um, uh, how do you say this, uh, backup uh, of all of these cups because you, you use for and beer and Coca-Cola the same cups. 